Hello! In the last video, we took a look at an Amiga 1200 motherboard that had a dead short between the 5 volt and ground rail. We tried to fix the fault by removing all of the electrolytic capacitors ready for recapping, but unfortunately that didn't fix the issue. So, in this video, we're going to use a different method to try and find the fault. I've crossed out all of the electrolytics from last time, however, this time I'm expecting it to be a failed ceramic capacitor. The only problem is, there's a lot of them. So many in fact, I've probably missed a few of this picture. And that's not all, you should see the other side of the board. There's a whole load more! Now we can reduce the number we need to worry about by taking a look at the Amiga 1200 schematics and finding all the capacitors that go across the supply rails. These are mainly decoupling capacitors. So, looking at the top side, we can see this considerably reduces the number we need to worry about. And on the back, there's substantially less too. That still leaves a lot. And rather than remove each capacitor one by one, there's several other ways we can find the fault. The first method is the finger touching method. This involves simply powering up the board and touching parts to see what's hot, but I don't recommend this as it's possible to burn your finger, and I've done that before. Another method is to put a dot of isopropanol alcohol on the top of each of the chips. Then, power it up and see which chip dries out the quickest. That one will most likely be the faulty one, or in this case, the chip I put in upside down. This works great for large parts like chips, and great for finding possible faults from memory chips too, but with these tiny surface mount capacitors it'd be very difficult. Another way you can do this is if you have a multimeter with enough accuracy. Sometimes it's possible to measure tiny changes in resistance as you move away from where the short circuit is. This tends to work better if the fault isn't a dead short, but it still is possible. Sadly, my meter isn't accurate enough, so I'm going to use a different method. I'm going to use a thermal camera. Many years ago I built this one using the GridEye 8x8 sensor. It would work for this job, but it would take a long time. I've also got this thermal sensor. This is a 32 by 24 pixel resolution. A lot better, but I haven't gotten around to setting it up yet. So instead, I'm going to use this beast. This is a professional thermal camera, and it has a much higher resolution. You can also get thermal cameras that will overlay the heat on a normal colour image, which is really helpful for seeing exactly what's hot. Sadly, I didn't get that model, but not to worry, it'll do the job. Now to use this, I need to power up the board, and you can't just power this up using a normal power supply for this. We need a current limited supply. I've connected a small resistor across the power supply, and you can see at 5 volts it draws just under 500 milliamps. But if I restrict the current below that, the power supply drops the supply voltage to maintain the maximum current setting. This means a small amount of power will be delivered to the board, and somewhere that power will get dissipated as heat, hopefully inside the faulty parts. That's the plan at least. So let's go back to our game of capacitor roulette, and we'll start with the upper side of the board. So pick a capacitor, pause the video, leave a comment saying which one you think it is, and then finally unpause and watch. So first I'm going to connect our little short circuit detector, and I'm going to switch to the thermal camera and turn on the power. I've also overlaid the motherboard so you can see roughly where everything is. The heat in the corners is most likely where I picked it up from. Well that was disappointing, nothing on the top side. No visible heat changes at all. So either this doesn't work, or the fault is on the back. So let's play that game again. Pick a capacitor, leave a comment, and then unpause. We'll start by flipping over the board. Now the power is off at this point, and back to the thermal image, I've overlaid the motherboard image again to help. Wow, that lit up like a light bulb. I haven't even speeded this up. Looking a little closer at the board, we can see the precise culprit. So, if you guessed number 35, otherwise known as capacitor C30D, then you were right. So let's get that out of there. I've gotten my silly short circuit detector connected again here, and look, it just went green! Excellent! This just leaves a little isopropanol alcohol cleanup. So with the fault found, let's recap the board. But first, I'm going to remove the TV modulator, as once that's removed, there's several capacitors we no longer need to replace. And the less of them there are, the less that could leak in the future. Now 
I've paused the recap here because this is a very interesting and important part. On Revision 1 boards, this was an electrolytic capacitor, mounted this way round. And on Revision 2 boards, it's a tantalum, but it's mounted the opposite way round. You need to be very careful here, don't just look at a random picture on the internet to check the orientation. You need to get this correct for the revision of your motherboard. Because if you get it wrong, and don't try this at home, your capacitor might leak all over the board, or worse, completely explode! Let's see that a little slower. And yes, I was standing well out the way. If you're not sure which way round to put it, then you can use a multimeter to see which pin is connected to ground. So, with that all done, I'm going to boot this up and use the diagram chips to give it a quick test. Wow, this sure does some funky things while it loads. Diagram is great for fixing faults, as it will almost always boot in one form or another. You can even connect to it via serial port if the display isn't working. So, let's work our way through the tests. I've speeded this up a little too. Audio tests, now these are fun, well, the LED filter works, and then a little bit of music too. I'm not sure what this test is doing, it doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. Maybe I'm just impatient. But to be sure, later I've ran this through the Amiga Test Kit RAM tester. Seems like it all works okay! So, I'm going to swap out the diagrams with some Kickstart 3.2 ROMs. Excellent! Let's power it up and see if it works properly. Fantastic! A kickstart screen! Now let's start everybody's favourite game. And it boots! So it looks like I have a fully working Amiga 1200 to add to my collection. And I've got a few upgrades I want to give it, including putting the board into a nice case. I hope you found that interesting. If you did, consider giving the video a like. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.